Now joining us from New York City is law professor and Rappler thought leader Theodore Te Teddy Te. Ted, how are you doing? Hi, Maria. I'm doing well. Thanks. So for you, all the way on the other side of the world, uh, what stands out about these hearings? Well, one thing that does stand out, as Chell has pointed out, is I think the underwhelming uh, capacity of, of the lawyers in terms of presenting the case to the Senate as well as to the public. And when I say lo the lawyers, I refer to the lawyers of both sides. Because I think the, the nature of the impeachment proceedings is that it's extraordinary. You do not remove the head of the of a depart of the, the judicial branch every day. It requires a certain a high level of of of, uh, of uh, betrayal of public trust that that would warrant a removal. And so, therefore, the these proceedings are extraordinary. And so, we would expect that uh, the people who are presenting the case should you know, perform extraordinarily. But so far, the impression that I've gotten is that this is actually equivalent to just an ordinary litigation in a, a trial court, and not even, you know, not, not even an ordinary litigation. I've seen actually better cases tried in the ordinary trial courts. The defense keeps saying that, uh, that you need to protect the rights of Chief Justice Corona, and for example, the, the Senate on the first day ruled against having him testify in his own impeachment trial. What do you make of these two um, approaches? Well, I, I agree that uh, that uh, Chief Justice Corona has certain rights that need to be protected in these proceedings. And uh, I think Chell has already mentioned that in relation to the right against self-incrimination, the right to due process, the right to confront uh, his accusers and to, to see the evidence that is being presented against him. However, in relation to, in relation to how the proceeding is being conducted, I think what what the proceedings lack right now is a clear theory on the part of the Senate, on the part of the prosecution, and on the part of the defense. They each have their own theories, and it is amazing that we could proceed to trial with three different theories, apparently, because uh, Justice Cuevas is saying, arguing, understandably, that this should be uh, a criminal proceeding, uh, satisfying the highest burden of proof. The prosecution is now saying we want a more liberal standard. And the Senate, so far, has not really defined what, what they're looking for. So I think in terms of leadership, I think the Senate president, who has done remarkably so far, should maybe take that extra step and say, let's all take a step back. Let's all see if we're on the same page, because after all, this will all be, you know, this will all be, be futile if in the end the prosecution presents evidence that the Senate is not looking for. Those are great points. But moving forward, I guess part of now, the question now is uh, what will, what do you want to see the, senator, the senators do? Well, one thing that, one thing that I, I did catch uh, when, when Senator uh, Miriam Santiago uh, joined the, the impeachment trial after after being absent for some time is her statement that let's let's hear the evidence first and then determine later on uh what what we should consider and i think that that is a correct posture in terms of of what the senate is supposed to do because as i have as i have stated before the senate here acts as a jury of sorts and as a jury, they should receive facts and then based on those facts, make conclusions of law. Now, as far as, as the, the standard for determining whether the facts support the conclusions, that would, I think, be up to the individual senators. But one, one, one parameter or one framework that the senators can work with is one that the Supreme Court itself has used, which is the totality of circumstances. When you say the totality of circumstances, you consider not only the present circumstances, you also consider past circumstances and even future circumstances. Because all of these would, would have a bearing on the continued fitness of the Chief Justice to remain in office. And that is really the only issue here. It is not whether he is guilty of a crime, because this is not a criminal trial. It is whether he should continue as Chief Justice. And we cannot make a determination. If I were a senator, we cannot make that determination unless we hear everything that is directly relevant to that particular issue. 
So rather than cutting off, for example, evidence that might not on, at this time be, be relevant, I think the Senate should allow a certain degree of liberality in simply hearing the testimony and decide later on if it wants to consider it or not, for so long as the evidence uh, will will allow the, the Chief Justice to, to for example, to, to be heard on it, or if the Chief Justice is not given, the, is, is not surprised by it, then the Senate should, I think, be liberal in that sense. So I think in that respect, Congressman Tupas is correct in asking for some degree of liberality, because after all, there are eight counts. And yeah. if you look at the totality of circumstances, all these eight counts may actually indicate a pattern of betrayal of public trust, or one count in itself may be sufficient to indicate betrayal of public trust. But we do, we will not know that until all eight counts have been heard. It just seemed like Tupas was unclear exactly what he was asking for. But let me ask you now, you wrote a piece today uh, under our thought leaders section that compares um, the impeachment trial of the United States of former President Bill Clinton to what's going on here now. What are some of the best practices that, that you would recommend from there? Well, one thing that I think uh, Chell had already mentioned is the, the extensive uh, use of pretrial uh, procedures. And, and that, is, that is significant for me in, in relation to the Corona impeachment and the Clinton impeachment trial. In the Clinton impeachment trial, the Senate had a rule that said witnesses would not be allowed unless they had been deposed before the trial. And that's why everything had been done before the trial. All of the depositions were taken. Counsels for both parties were there. They were under oath. They were, uh, they were reduced to writing. And in some instances, for, uh, for Clinton and, and Lewinsky, they were videotaped. And the Senate had the benefit of being able to read, or in, in Clinton and Lewinsky's uh, cases, to see them testify. And because of that rule, it simplified a lot of, of matters. Uh, they, they remove all of the, you know, all of the unnecessary wrangling or objections or, uh, over, or over documents because they were settled before the trial. So that's, that's one. Second, uh, I think the Senate in, in the Clinton trial had a very clear direction, had a very clear theory in terms of what they wanted to hear, even though the vote was partisan in the end because they voted along party lines. Democrats opposed the, opposed the conviction, Republicans wanted to convict and remove Clinton. But in the end, they were very clear that what they were looking for was a higher standard of proof. They were saying this is not an ordinary felony, this is not an ordinary crime, this is something more serious than that, simply because it is impeachment and we are trying to remove a president from office. So in, in, the, in the corona trial, I think what the Senate should be looking for is that higher standard. We are actually looking for betrayal of public trust, and it is not a crime as defined in our statute books. And therefore, there must be something more than a crime. In the, in the Clinton trial, one senator expressed it as felony plus, meaning uh, it, it may amount to a crime, but it, even if it is not so, it is something more than that, which would render the president unfit to continue. So it may be a standard that the, 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 the Senate in the corona trial may want to, to adopt. But I think in the end, individually, the senators must make up their minds. What standard will they use in terms of of, of looking at the evidence and in terms of voting. Because remember, this is a one-time thing. If the, if the evidence is not heard because they decide to keep it out or the, or, or the prosecutors are not allowed to present it, and then later on one senator says, no, I wanted to hear that because it is relevant, then they'll never be able to get a chance to hear it. So in terms of the Clinton trial, they admitted everything that was relevant and then they considered it. So I think that's that's one of that's one thing you can take away from the Clinton trial. What standard would you recommend for this Corona impeachment? I think uh, consistent with with the the nature of the proceeding being being uh, administrative in nature, uh, because after all we are talking about a public office. Yeah. I think substantial evidence, but substantial evidence maybe along the lines of, of removing the, 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 the Chief Justice would, would require something graver, something, something more. We're not talking about an ordinary, ordinary employment here. We're talking about removing the, the Chief Justice of the, of the Republic. And therefore, substantial evidence would be something that a reasonable mind would, would, would accept as supporting the truth. And therefore, if, if 
the senators believe that what they're hearing is true and having heard what they have heard it is enough to convince them that he should not remain in office then the the standard is met we are not looking for preponderance of evidence we are not looking for proof beyond reasonable doubt because we are not actually con convicting the chief justice and finding him liable for a crime or for civil damages or for tort where considering removing him from office for betraying the public trust. Are, are Another you... standard that I think may be relevant, and some of the senators during the Clinton trial expressed this, is the standard of an ordinary person. I don't remember the name of the senator, but I think he, he, he's, he was from Kansas and he was saying, I asked myself, what would an, an ordinary person from Kansas think of these charges? And he was, he was Republican and he voted to convict. But that was the standard he used. A third standard would be a standard that after hearing everything, is it sufficient to consider the continuance in office of the president as dangerous or prejudicial to liberties? And if, if we look at that, that, that is a standard that I think may be adopted in relation to the chief justice. Because if after hearing everything, the senators believe that the chief justice cannot remain in office, because it impairs his ability to, to perform his duties as Chief Justice, then they must vote to convict and remove. But if they are not convinced after having heard everything they have been, been presented, then they must vote to acquit. So I think, again, that's a takeaway from the Clinton trial because there is no precedent here. We've never had a completed impeachment trial. We have no record to speak of in terms of, of successful impeachment trials. And so therefore, the, the only relevant uh, uh, trial that may be of persuasive influence would be the Clinton trial. Do you think that one of the, the problems, the questions that keeps getting raised now is the speed of, of how fast this was, in the words of some of the critics, railroaded through the House of Representatives? Are the rights of the Chief Justice protected enough if you take the lowest possible level of evidence? Well, you know what, ra railroading, as people would say, the, the impeachment complaint before the House, actually prejudice, prejudice the House more than the Chief Justice. Because I think if they had been given more time to deliberate or to discuss, the case would have been tighter. I think if I were defense counsel and listening to those charges, I wouldn't need to say much until I've heard the prosecution say everything they, they, they want to say. Because by, by, by presenting the case on eight grounds, many of these grounds could have been collapsed if they had been given more time to deliberate, discuss, or even depose the Chief Justice. I think, uh, I think the, the, the lack of preparation, the time that was, that was spent on, on impeaching the Chief Justice one day was, I think, more prejudicial to the House prosecutors than to the defense because the, the, the charges could have been written better. They could have been, the elements could have been shorter. The, some, of the, some of the qualifications could have been removed because these qualifications actually I think present obstacles to, to, to satisfying the burden of proof on the part of the prosecutors. Okay, Teddy Te from New York City, thank you very much for your thoughts on this process. We'll come back to you, I'm sure, in the coming days. Thank you, Maria.